Huzzah, Rangers! This is your boy Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers Show. I wanted to let everybody know this episode is sponsored by Inkify, which is our sponsor. They do custom printing and embroidery since uh, 2010. Uh, they provide high-quality decorated material nationwide, from ordering the apparel to printing, adding a private label, folding, bagging, fulfillment, all of that stuff. They handle everything for you, so you don't have to do any of that stuff visit inkify.com uh and you'll be able to get started on your order and tell them tjrs sent you and you'll get 15 percent off of your order i am very proud and excited to have bt from the rugby pickup show join us how the hell are you bt i'm good phil thanks for having me on you uh, welcome. never gets old watching you drink out of the cup in the intro <laughs> you know Pretty you got to right? take this victory lap while you can because right. the only Listen. thing harder than winning a ship is defending it so absolutely and we'll you, see you how to defend means. the crown as uh you know the mlr's greatest podcaster I appreciate that, man. You know, like we we like to sit on a throne around here, but you know, there, there's some pretty good ones out there for sure. But none of them are as active as we are. Uh, I think that's fair to say for sure. You know, we we do this 365 pretty much. I mean, we don't take we don't have an off season. We just keep going, man. Like uh, people getting into their preseason right now, we're we're already at a full sprint. You know, we never stopped. So that that's pretty cool to think about. But uh, yeah, man, um, a lot going on with MLR. It's wacky right now. And we're still celebrating, as you were saying, you know, like we won the ship. Um, that was me drinking out of the uh, the cup there, the Eastern Conference uh, Championship. And uh, we're just continuing to have our victory lap, even though, you know, when, when the season kicks off, we'll calm down a little bit. For right now, we're still celebrating, man. I'm, I'm still thrilled that our New England Free Jacks uh, won the championship. But I wanted why to add, wouldn't you? I mean, exactly. la last one standing on the Northeast Coast, Amen. almost. Uh, Bozo's in the uh, the comments as as he always is. The king of the comments is here. Uh, BT, you were late, is what Bozo was saying. Uh, and BT, epic stash, bruh. He likes the stash. And I said off camera, it's looking real good, man. Looking real, real good. So I hope. You well, I know around. Bozo. You know, as a military man, it's like if you're not right. early, you're late. So I get it. Yeah. Although top of the hour, you know, sometimes it's it's better to start at 05. But sure. either way, Phil, it's an honor to be back on the show. I listen to you guys religiously because, quite frankly, there's no better place to get the beat report. You know, back in the day, all the teams had a beat writer who would travel yeah. with the team. Now that, like, doesn't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know the the Rangers do their best to turn over every stone when That's it right. comes to the Free Jacks. So right. I'm excited to talk about MLR, but also, you know, the free jacks have cooking um yeah. in their development squads because i just came back from texas and was down scouting i, I had a lot of hats on down there but Excellent. was down in austin uh where the old uh, austin elite used to play oh out wow. of round rock texas it, it really makes me feel old like thinking back to how many iterations of mlr there's been now but mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's good to be on and i'm excited to, to dig in where do you want to start Let's let's talk about MLR first. I mean, obviously, we do want to get into the collegiate All Star uh, tournament that took place down there. But I wanted to ask you because there's so much that's been happening with MLR, and, and I value your opinion tremendously um, as somebody that like it has has their you know they understand you are one of those guys that have the you know you 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 know the pulse of this league, and and I, I just really value opinion your opinion. So I wanted to quickly ask you, Kitmas for the rest of the league happened yesterday. Of course, the Free Jacks we sit high on uh, looking down on everybody else. Um, uh, we, we had our kitmas a month ago at this point. Uh, you know, you, it seems like you would want to release that sort of stuff before Christmas, but what do I know? I'm just some idiot uh, that does a podcast. But uh, who had the best home and away kit in 2024? Who do you think uh, I mean, get that crown? I like when two, two colors contrast with each other. So okay. that's hard for the Free Jacks to do, given you have like the three core American colors. Mm -hmm. um, and I do like hoops. You know, I like stripes. I like that contrast. So yeah. I'm going to give it to Chicago. Um, a lot of people say Chicago, yeah. I'm a big fan of the green and white, too. Obviously, Denver Barbarians are my squad. So, um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I'm excited. I never really root for a team. I always root for my guys in the league who I right. know. And, yep. and a lot of guys have ended up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is when it comes to just straight kit, I love how we can, you know, get in the comments section and argue about something as subjective uh, yep. as artistic design. Yep. Um, and, and Utah always has a really clean product, right? Mm, uh, the red, yeah. white, and black with the mountains. Um, yeah, I just think Chicago took it home. Uh, I don't know what the hell Dallas is thinking, 
Um, really? Isn't what? the Dallas Stars like a hockey I, team in Dallas? Like, come on. I, the I, Jackals. Find a way to align with the Jackals, not not put a big star on the jersey. But, hey, you know, it, it, you're going to have to have different kits every year. I just don't right. understand why the league doesn't go with a traditional dark and white. There is going to be some crazy, ugly clashes. Yeah. Um, so, good luck for the announcers and the colorblind people. But, <laughs> right, I yeah, mean, exactly. it's like, oh, my God, when Old Glory is on the road playing Miami at home, there's there's just going to be some some tough looks. On yeah, the it's going to be but, really strange. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said about having a solid color and then a white away kit, right? Yeah, because there's usually contrast away. there. Yes, um, absolutely. But they kind of went in all different directions with it. But, you know, it, getting asses in seats, as we talked about last time, is the most important priority for the league. 100%. You know, but keeping true to your to your team branding is also really important as well. Yeah. You know, we've seen teams that go through a couple rebrands it's almost like a, an SOS lifeline before they fold. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Experimenting I, with uh, the I called it feedback, too. But, yeah. um, you know, it is what it is. I mean, on to kind of the status of the league, I mm-hmm. think we were, we were saved by the Charlotte announcement because everybody was doom and gloom yes. uh, with teams folding and moving. But this is, this is America. This is how stock markets work. You know, things expand and then they recede. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like you can't just build a successful NFL style league overnight. It takes no, decades. Not. Yeah. Um, so it's a bummer to see players get scattered and people lose jobs. But at the same time, I mean, it's it's capitalism, right? Like if we didn't have uh, a place for the non-successful companies to go and die, everybody <laughs> would stay alive forever. Right. Yeah. And there'd be huge barriers to entry. Um, but I think the MLR can be happy with the new ownership group in LA. They obviously know what they're doing and they're connected and they've done rugby management before. Uh, but this Charlotte thing is really like the headline. That's kind of like, it sounded crazy at first. And then after a couple of days of reading it and realizing what the goal of the whole operation is going to be, it's like, Oh, fuck yeah. Like we, we want Americans playing hundred um, percent. Yeah. So I'm excited. Uh, the the leagues to to think that five teams have come and gone, right? If you include Austin and Glendale and all that already, um, it's pretty wild. But here we are, and uh, I think the Free Jacks have what it takes to defend their crown. You know, I I know you guys had a really interesting chat about what realistic expectations are. Yeah. Um. Obviously, like a semifinal appearance should be right around there. Mm-hmm. Um. But you know, you have the same core staff and playing group. So you sh- you shouldn't really be worried on the product. It's it's going to be tight. Yeah, I mean ultimately if 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 the Free Jacks come out and lay an egg and just have a terrible year, everybody will be shocked. Like literally not just the fans, but I think pundits as well. I mean, I nobody anticipates that. You've got that the the core staff have returned. I think what was it like uh, 12 out of 13 of all of like the people that are responsible for the playing product, you know, the, the medical, the physios, you know, strength and conditioning, the assistant coaches, all of those guys are back. And then you return 65 to 70 percent of your roster. That's incredible for MLR uh, retention rate. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, high expectations for our free jacks for sure. But I always say, you know, final four, if you make the final four, there's no reason to complain uh, in the off season. So, yeah. Uh, Bozo also chiming in here saying, BT, only two champs left in the league, Seattle and Free Jacks. How about that, right? LA, obviously gone, the Guiltinis. New York, also gone. I mean, that that's pretty interesting to think about is there's only two champions remaining from the championships that have been won in the six years uh, in MLR going into our seventh year. That's pretty crazy. It is. It is. And, um, you know, it's two good organizations that yeah. haven't budged on their branding or strategy right. and have had the best attendance. So that's right. there you yep. go. If, do yep. you see a link to success? It's yep. get your front office right and mm-hmm. the play the play on the field will follow. Absolutely. Um, and butts but, and yeah, will also the, follow. Yeah, exactly. The, the Free Jacks really, they know what they're doing. Um, you know, I know we're going to get to the recruiting, but do you feel like there's a huge opportunity now with New York folding to, I don't know, lay claim to more of the tri-state when it comes to, you know, the recruiting pipeline? Because I'm from Connecticut and I always yes. used to joke, it's an, an exclusive club. 
Uh, it's the only state that's in New England and the tri-state area. So right. Yeah, that, for all the people around the world that give a shit, Connecticut <laughs> coming in hot. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's I, there, there was always an opportunity to grow a fan base. You saw with the Patriots, they had flirted with moving to Hartford. Thank God right. they did. That would yep. be terrible. I agree. Um, but yeah, I think with New York folding, like there's a huge metro population there that now aren't being served. That's right. It's something that I don't really consider, uh, but it is something to factor in for sure going forward, because I know that you know we'll, uh, we'll, of course, get to it. We're kind of walking in that direction, talking about the collegiate all-stars. They had a team there, the Tri-State Foundry. Is that right? That's it. And so, I think that yeah. was a play on like ironworking, metalworking. Exactly. The Foundry is where you, you mold young talent. Exactly. Um, so Yeah, I actually know their coach, Austin Ryan. He's an old high school teammate of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Director wow. of rugby at Fairfield U. Um, okay. But I was yeah. really impressed by all the coaches this weekend, Phil. These guys aren't getting paid, you know, to go down to Texas. If anything, they have to raise money um, mm -hmm. on behalf of their little NCR team and, and region. Yep. Um, and even the players, like, it's a huge opportunity to kind of, especially if you play at a really small college, uh, just to see what the higher standard of rugby is like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it would take a whole podcast to sort through the history of USA Rugby, Collegiate, and NCR. But mm -hmm. essentially, NCR is like a new organization that has its foothold in, in the East Coast and representing some of those smaller schools that weren't getting a lot of attention under mm -hmm. the USA Rugby bubble. Right. Um, and, and they're putting on great events. Was it a sellout crowd with the Austin Rugby community, you know, going nuts in the stand? No. Um, it was, it was at an athletic complex, kind of 40 minutes North of the city. And there were some oh, okay. parents there and it was, it was nice. It was beautiful. Uh, but you know how hard it is to, to actually get a, a kind of travel tournament buzz because right. everybody's flying into one spot. Yep. What then do you kind of push out in the Austin rugby community to say, Hey, this is happening here. Yep. But luckily for NCR, they had a great stream and anybody could watch around the yep. globe and, that's probably where I'm guessing they got you know most of their eyeballs on this thing. But I was yeah. there with my pen and my clipboard, writing down names, asking coaches, building relationships, who are the best players who can translate to the next level, and not just MLR. I mean, I when I spoke with players, I would even say, like, you realize only 5% of, of this all-star selection is potential MLR. But as you know, in, in the club game, there's a ton of opportunities to play. You know, Absolutely. after college and i yeah. know players have a lot of tread on their tires and they just start to get the bug and the itch and they're like i want to keep playing so yep. you know i was down there to make sure that you know i at least get my eyes on some of the top talented guys and see who wants to come to denver and, and play for the denver <laughs> barbarians there you go you always got you always working in the denver barbarians listen i appreciate it man if, if i was I, i'm not a mystic guy but i'm a fan of theirs of course so if i was well a i did meet guy, a friend uh i yep. believe his name is tc um okay. he was down there um with his mystic colors on but yeah there was a really strong showing from the northeast yeah um a lot of coaches there and really just people that I think are supporting this thing NCR yeah. um, yeah. because as you know, your, your independents have an ambitious spring um, with the trip 100%. to Ireland. Yeah. But they also traveled with like the deepest team. So they had, they, they broke the whole thing into for every region you had your all stars and your rising stars mm -hmm. and the rising yeah. stars were think of it as like varsity JV, right? Yes. That was the younger players, the ones that still need a, you know, a bit of seasoning. Mm -hmm. um, but, there were two rising star teams for New England, yes. uh, the Reds and the Whites. And while they weren't the best team on the weekend, the fact that New England traveled with, you know, what, what looked to be like 60 plus guys tell me they had their ducks in a row from it's fundraising to coaching. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's great to see. And I remember even a while ago when they published like the map mm -hmm. of, of how they have different sections of New England and what the pathway looks like and, I think that's helpful as a player to know that yeah. if you play well and you, and you do what's asked of you, there's going to be kind of a a ladder that, that you get rung up. Um, and it's I think important. that, yeah, just like all the things in the New England front office, it's it's they got it on lockdown, Phil. They know what We're the, the best. hell they're doing. We're yeah, the best. I know. Continue. I didn't want to say it, but. No, no, no. It's true.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you, I mean, of course, you know, establishing the pathway and having those rungs on the ladder is extremely important. And the Free Jacks, by the way, pretty much did that from the very, very beginning with getting their academies in order, you know, their regional academies and then saying, okay, well, if you, if we're going to scout all these players, we're going to identify talent and then we're going to invite you to the junior Jacks. And then, you know, as you continue your, your development and get older, maybe you can become an independent uh, you know, the under 23 squad. And then, of course, you could be a part of the collegiate all stars that they bring down there, three full teams of players. And then maybe, you know, you, you make your way on to the independence. And then if you get, uh, you know, the ball bounces your way and you're good enough, maybe you can work your way on to the Free Jacks roster, just like a couple of our guys did Ethan Fryer, you know, Cam Davidowitz, all of these guys that we can name that are, you know, Free Jacks consistently now working them way into the league it's through that pathway and what's interesting is like you know everybody talks about oh there's too many foreigners in the league well you know 10 years from now that's not going to be really a, a conversation because if the pathways work the way that we anticipate them to be the collegiate draft is going to be a big big deal uh going forward you're going to find playmakers immediately that can help your roster down the line and that will be coming through the pathways and these these um scouts and these gms will know exactly they won't have to guess on any of this because they would have seen them coming through these pathways and know these players very very well not just at the collegiate level but you know younger than that through the age group so it's all very very exciting we're at the very beginning of this so people that kind of do this there's a lot of these guys out there bt you know this they, they do this Oh, I, I can't stand this MLR, man. There's too many foreigners in the league. They're not paying attention to USA rugby talent. You know, all that other, all that nonsense that gets thrown around. These people just they they have no patience. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. But you know, eventually, as long as this thing keeps going, man, we're gonna be all right. That's well, the way I feel I about mean, it. That's true. But I will say that the next seven year block is the most important for mm. survival. Yeah. If we fizzle out at our World Cup. And we don't sell out stadiums yep. and the Eagles are lackluster and don't get out of pool play, mm -hmm. uh, then we're in trouble. Yeah. But when, when you say be patient, I do agree with you. We need to build. And the reality is, even though, you know, I was out looking at kids in college, which ranged from ages 18 to 22, like, yes, they, they could be in our 2031 world cup team, but it's most likely current high schoolers, right, that are going to be uh, coming into their prime of their career. Um, yeah. But I want to go back to what you said about the the foreigner uh, domestic split because yeah. you can argue all you want what what the right fit for MLR is. I think they started out with eight game day internationals. It flexed up to ten. Now you can buy an international spot. It got really blurry there for a second. Yeah, I believe the goal is to then wind that back down. Right. Um, but right now, coaches, GMs, I mean, they're on a win now basis, right? This yeah. is this is how the business works. So I mean, when you hire a guy, keeping score here, so you might as well try to win. Yeah, right? and guys are going to bring in the guys they know because they they want to keep their jobs and they want to win. So sure. regardless of how you feel with the MLR, um, there's going to be foreigners. There's going to be domestic players. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. What do you think the split should be for, I don't know, let's say like uh, a D1 NCR college team? Gosh, I, what's, I a, what's a healthy split? Because I asked a lot of coaches and I got a lot of honest answers. And I'm curious to hear what you think. I, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, maybe, gosh, 50, 50%. Damn, you, you nailed it, Phil. Yeah. Most coaches, when I said, what's your foreign domestic split, they said 50-50. And yeah. I was flabbergasted because really? I, I coach for a school of mines, this small engineering college in, in, in Golden, Colorado. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to get, you know, one international who just happened to be there on, on an exchange. Right. Um, I do realize a lot of these coaches' jobs is to increase enrollment, right. increase the scholarship funding win games right yeah. and i guess they do that by recruiting internationally because yeah. there's obviously an urge to emigrate here to the u.s yep. a lot of young players see the collegiate route as a path to not only do it but mm -hmm. get an education for your kid right. um but i was shocked i, I was like really 50 50 like 
can you not put together a competitive team at say 70% Americans, 30% internationals? And most coaches were like, ah, no, nah, 50, 50. Right. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> really? All right. Then well, there's, there's certainly that's where it's at. Yeah, there's certainly an advantage still to this day of bringing in internationals that have been playing rugby since they were five years old, right? That, that, that experience is is wanted. And when you're in an organization like that at a collegiate level, winning is is important to drive, you know, donations from your alumni, get them engaged and stuff like that. So that's kind of a cheat code, right, to bringing in those guys internationally that have been playing since they were very, very young kids, as opposed to recruiting guys from, like, you know, maybe they just started in, like, 10th grade or something like that. Good athletes it's always right but um yeah I, if, if if i was coaching and my job was you know getting the alumni engaged to get donations to help fund my salary and all that sort of stuff yeah i, I mean i would be looking at a 50 50 split i'd be recruiting heavily overseas at this point um and of course we want all of that to change going forward with uh kids picking up a rugby ball you know in elementary school and, and learning how to play the game and going through the ranks and stuff like that but right now yeah the 50 50 sounds about right and I got educated as well by these coaches. I mean, if you think of how you take a program from from nothing to varsity status, mm -hmm. you you want to the, these young schools like they want to increase enrollment. You know, yep. they just like if you're looking at a business and you want to grow revenue, um, you got to bring in more customers, right? So yep. when a coach is like, "Hey, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be at this job for a while. I'm going to play the long game," and they start landing more, you know, international players who for the most part are usually paying full tuition right because right. it's it's pretty hard to kind of get the international um offer and a full scholarship mm -hmm. um you you see how how you bring more money into the school and how you eventually say to the school look i'm bringing more kids to the table this is growing give us varsity status give us scholarships give us more resources um the schools just want to grow their enrollment you know? That's right. And yeah. I think the savvy coaches are the ones that really understand that. Mm -hmm. um, now, Bozo has a comment here that he understands the foreign players counter argument, but they sharpen the skills for everybody. Yeah. Now, I saw that. I definitely saw that over the weekend. Some of the best players were, you know, either Argentinian recruits or Zimbabwe, South African recruits. But there were some gun American players, too. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, it's a mix of both. But I don't know. I just maybe it's the optimist in me, but I feel like coaches can learn how to win. You know, you really just got to make your the internationals you sign count. Mm -hmm. um, and I also heard some interesting feedback on it's a lot easier to say uh, manage and discipline an international player with the care and the stick when you have oh. not just a scholarship, but like yeah. their place in the U.S. rides on their success sure. uh, than an average American student. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I heard a lot of feedback and it was interesting and it's going to kind of um, really paint a picture for how coaches recruit in the future and, um, you know, which programs are going to kind of rise up and, and be dominant. But yeah. Yeah. on the weekend, Phil, unfortunately, it, it wasn't your independence um, weekend. I know they were two time reigning champs. That's right. Um, yep. But the two teams that really stood out were the, the champions, the Great Lakes Thunderbirds mm -hmm. and the Midwest Barbarians. And I was lucky enough, I, you know, I made a donation to the Midwest Barbarians because I have a player um, who plays for the Barbarians who actually coaches with them, not to okay. mention the, the name linked up. Um, but it was yeah. a great coaching staff. You know, they kind of let me sit in in their meetings and see how the sausage was made. Mm -hmm. um, but they had some really, really good players from Principia. Um, and there was a semifinal against your New England Independence, the red team. Yeah. That was a barn burner. And now granted, I'll, I'll just set the scene. Like this is a lot of games throughout the day mm -hmm. and they were playing 20 minute halves, right? right. Cause it's all star rugby. You got to plug and play and you yep. can't really just dedicate most game time to one set of players. Also players have to play all day, Saturday, Sunday. So they're going to run out of steam, right? Yep. They're playing huge chunks of minutes, 100%. but there was a semifinal and it was like as exciting as possible. And at first I was getting a little ticked off at the Free Jacks coaches, because they kept taking the three points. I'm like, it's all-star rugby. Freaking <laughs> tap the ball and run. Like, right, right. But they they went up 8 nothing, um, And then I think they got a second score, you know, to go up 12 nothing, and, and it was just really exciting because it was a two-score game. 
And then the Barbarians scored, and it was like, uh oh, one score game. Free Jacks got the ball back, and, and again, they decided to kick. Everybody just wants to play territory. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the final seconds, um, some of those Principia boys got their hands on the ball in the open field, and I'm sure MCR tagged it and, and, and sent it viral. But they scored under the sticks with zero seconds left. Oh, incredible. And they sat, they had to convert, and then right after, you know, it was, it was, um, it was celebrations and, and heartbreak for the independent Reds. Yeah. Uh, the Midwest team did go on to get whooped up in the final, uh, 34 nothing against the Thunderbirds. But, you know, the, the school, the players from the schools that really stood out were St. Thomas Moore. Um, okay. Yep. That's in that Great Lake region. Yep. Uh, Marion University. Okay. Um, but some of the AIC boys uh, for the New England Independents, uh, I believe it was Amanio Manu. And okay. uh, off a saint, they were my standouts for the wow. New England Reds. Um, but really, you guys, it's it's clear from the team sheet that you pull from all over New England, from mm -hmm. Brown to Endicott to UMass to Bowdoin yep. to Dartmouth. Dartmouth, so yeah, yeah. There was there was a good showing all across the board, and you know the fact that you had two teams in the top pool, one team in the bottom, like it, yeah. it's just a sign of strength of the organization. Absolutely. You know, from the very beginning, it, it you know, because the first rugby game in America was played in Boston. Like it, it, College and the Northeast rugby has always been a powerhouse. Right. So a lot of teams around this area to pick talent from, you know, we got that great pipeline, you know, for the pathway into the Free Jacks with all of our collegiate uh, players around New England. So it's very, very encouraging that they continue to bring multiple teams to these tournaments. As far as I know, no other team brought more than one team. Is that is that accurate? Well, most teams had had your your all-stars and your rising stars, so uh -huh. call that two teams. Okay. Uh, but no, the Free Jacks were the only one that had red, white, and blue. Right. And, and <laughs> their blue team actually – um, lost to the Thunderbirds as well in, in, in the final. But, um, yeah, it was just an awesome weekend of rugby. I had one player from the School of Mines playing for the Pacific team, and I really was just bouncing around from coaches to coaches, showing him the names of the list and say, you know, point to a name that impresses you. Yeah. Um, so I have my short list, Phil. You know, I'll be following up, making calls, and seeing what these guys want because especially – guys that play rugby at a high level, but are also at a, a top academic school. Yeah. The ultimate question is, do you want to pursue rugby all out to the point where you're willing to give up, say a $60,000 a right. year? Cause you know, some of these players with, with a, a good education called out what it is. Right. But, but are at least good at interviewing um, and have internships that get them set up. They yeah. can make 60 grand right no out doubt. the gate in the working no world. And yeah. I know that, MLR guys aren't making 60 grand. Maybe no, they're not. the all-stars, if you count the housing and everything, maybe the top of the top. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's also a short window in which you can play professional rugby. And That's true. You can, you can hump a computer desk their whole life. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really like, what do these guys want? And, and that's when I do my recruiting, at least I, I kind of push guys on, what do you want to accomplish on the field and away from the field? And, yeah. and what does the next decade of your life look like? I mean, it's all great things to ask these young men because it is important to make them aware that, you know, only 5% of these guys are going to make their way onto an MLR roster. So there are possibilities, like you're saying, Denver Barbarians, great club, very historic organization uh, there in Denver that, that they could pursue, you know, like Mystic in the Northeast, um, all of these other clubs that are around the country. You know, Chicago's got a couple of them that are very prestigious and play very, very high level of rugby. So, you know, some of these guys just aren't going to make it onto an MLR Russia, let's be honest, but they can find themselves in a very, very good men's program across the country, wherever they And I up. think some players can season a bit more in the, in the men's clubs. And yeah. let's say they come out at 21, but, you know, they, they hit a late growth spurt, right, and kind of grow into a huge forward frame. You yeah. might not get a look um, until you're tearing it up in your game film and you're yeah. you're, you're showing you you are every inch of six four two fifty right or, yeah or whatever you know scouter scouts are looking for evaluators as they call them mm -hmm. um, but your guys roster top to bottom seems pretty legit I know you got Zach Bastris coming in my boy to finish out his rookie deal how about yeah. that. In the NFL, and, they they call that like the the rookie the, sale. 
when right. you have a guy who's outperforming his contract. But yep. I know I know that Zach's going to work his way into some starting lineups this year and be a difference maker. You know, ever since you've been you know pumping his tires, and I knew this kid was going to be good, but I didn't know he's going to be quite as good as he is. I mean, he's super fast. He might be the fastest guy on the team. So I just hope he continues to get looks and, and is able to you know make impacts in games. He's come off the bench quite a bit more than he has started, but I'd love to see him start some games. Uh, this year more than last year. I think he started one game last year and, w- and was came off the bench like six games. So I would love to see that number a bit higher because the kid's got talent for sure. And uh, I really hope this is like the money year for him because it's the end of his last, like the, the beginning of his, uh, the last year of his rookie deal, as you were saying, is the best way to put it. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to have him uh, beyond this year in a free Jackson jersey. because I, I Contract year, that's what they yeah. call it. Contract yeah. year, money year, absolutely. So hopefully we'll continue to see him in the red, white, and blue. You know, his, his mom's a Patriots fan, so, you know, let's, let's keep him around New England, man. Why not? Yeah, and it just goes back to what a great, you know, organization this this NCR is. It's obviously before Zach's time, but mm-hmm. he played for a tiny little college in, in northern Colorado. You know, right. like it, a lot of players, I think there's some serious talent out there. And granted, like, the best players are still playing for Lindenwood for yeah. the varsity programs that are still under the USA rugby bubble. Uh, but this organization NCR, they, they really know what they're doing. And mm-hmm. I think the ability to have an all-star weekend where, okay, you know, you're, you're playing in a tiny little college against other tiny colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how can you do against the next best? Right. And, and well, you know, we'll stream it and see how you go. And then you get in front of more evaluators and, I really do think it's it's that buzzword that we always like to use, pathway. Yeah. Um, as long as the pathways exist, the talent, the cream will rise to the top. Amen. Absolutely. You know, it's not the end of the road for these guys if they do happen to make it on just like an uh, ARP team, like the, Mist- the Mystic River, because you will be scouted. You know, I was there at the all, pretty much all of the home games for uh, the Mystic River during their ARP season. And guess who was there? TK. Um, was there watching these guys play. I was there talking to him. I, I can attest to that, you know, they are paying attention to that competition and the players that play in it for potential roster spots on the Free Jacks. And, you know, the Free Jacks do this better than I think anybody in terms of bringing guys in that might be overlooked or, you know, not not quite ready for the MLR level and test them out during the preseason. And, you know, right before the preseason, I think they just finished up a high performance camp recently. So they're taking notes on all these guys that are watching everybody, they're evaluating all the guys that they invite in for potential. Let's say like, you know, somebody goes down an injury or you know, another guy goes down an injury. Then you're in a situation where well, you can trade for a guy or you can bring somebody in that you already know and have evaluated on your own territory to bring them in. So I think it's so smart of them to do that. Yeah, you don't want to be grasping at straws late in the right. season. and you know, hoping that a reference call is going to be like, all right, right. this is all we have to go on here. Yeah. You know, to yeah. see it in front of your your own evaluators and, and have everybody be on the same page, I think that's important. 100%. Um, but yeah, Phil, what are, what are you feeling like the themes of the offseason have been chaos? Chaos. What do you, what do you yeah. think is the actual season is going to look like? It's going to be really interesting to see because, you know, with with the two teams folding, Toronto and specifically New York, that that talent being spread across the league, I think we're going to see some tighter games amongst teams that, you know, picked up a couple of guys that can be difference makers. I I wonder about – I think Miami is going to be pretty dang good. I don't think they're going to be, like, excellent or anything like that, but I think that they're going to surprise some people. Um, Not quite sure about L.A. Um, Charlotte's going to be – unfortunately the punching bag i think uh but what's really cool is like you know I'm, I'm a charlotte guy i don't know if you can hear it in the accent or not i mean i've been up here for 13 years but i'm born and raised 30 miles from charlotte and and i'm i've been telling people in the previous episode and in this one i'm going to say it too if you if you're a neutral listening in the show like i'm surprised you are welcome but if you're just a, a neutral that you don't have a, a dog in the fight 
pick Charlotte as your team because if you if you're serious about USA Rugby and you're a USA Rugby fan, you want them to do well. And I would say that if you don't have a second team that you kind of have one eye on, just paying attention to, pick Charlotte as your second team uh, if you're a USA Rugby person because you know they're bringing in young USA talent with the hopes of them you know, you know being ushered into the USA Eagles team, and that's what it's all about being competitive in that world cup that we're hosting because if we don't get out of the group stage as you were saying it's kind of like it's a big huge missed opportunity for this country so another interesting thing that supports your thesis that charlotte might get pumped a couple times this year is if brian ray is correct and scott lawrence is going to be basically coaching and and gming that that charlotte team Mm -hmm. um you can bet your ass that players who are eagle eligible are going to want to like have a ripper of a game against oh, charlotte yeah. oh, with yeah. scott intently watching those games so yeah charlotte might be on the the you know ass whooping end of some score lines mm-hmm. but eh, i mean world rugby's foot in the bill right who right. cares yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's it. the thing is like they'll get better iron sharpens iron if you get your butt kicked over and over again eventually you're either gonna you know, just, you know, tuck tail and run, or you're going to get a little bit better each time that you get your butt kicked. So it'll be interesting to see how that they shake out. I'm really excited about that franchise, obviously being from that area and playing in that area. You know, I picked up my first rugby ball 30 miles from Charlotte and I played for the Charlotte old originals a great, fantastic, prestigious club in the South. Um, So there's a lot of people that are going to be very, very excited about rugby being in the Charlotte area. Um, But, you know, I, I just hope the best for him. I really, really do. In a couple of years from now, maybe that that program will be really, really good. This franchise there in Charlotte, uh, if they continue to retain the players that they bring in uh, and kind of build upon it. So super excited for that. Uh, I think the Free Jacks are going to have a, a great year. Uh, I think I don't think we're going to see like 50 to fives or 80 to fives uh, like we did last year with Nola and uh, Toronto against the Free Jacks. I think the games are going to be close. Nola to has gotten whooped by you guys. It's a beautiful to the point where they owe you. Like, yeah, Yeah. you might get snake bit on one of these times where Nola is like enough's enough. We're gonna beat this team. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I mean, there's enough of a track record now. Well, there's clear dominance uh, from the Free Jacks. Well, we have the guys started. Yeah, we, we've got the vampire. That's the curse, right? So, like, he <laughs> played for Nola, and they beat us, and then he comes to the Free Jacks, and we beat them. So, we still have him this year. So, I think it's going to be two wins for us. You know what Nola really needs to focus on? Not beating the Free Jacks, getting into the fucking playoffs. Like, period, point blank. This is year seven. They've existed from the very beginning. They've never ever made the playoffs. So, that should be their focus. That it shouldn't be beat um, New England. You know, all that they touch the sign. It should be get into the fucking playoffs. The time, the sign they should touch on their way out of uh, their dugout, there, uh, their locker room, onto the field there, uh, in Mardi Gras land. That that's really the thing that they have to focus on. I mean, if if, if the playoff structure stays the same, eight out of a twelve teams are going to make it, which is ridiculous, by the way. But that should be them. And if they happen to slip and fall in their own vomit again this year, you bet we the free the Jacks Ranger show are going to give them so much shit. Yeah, um, it, it's embarrassing at this point, man. Like they were really good last year in terms of talent. I was on their bag bandwagon. I was like, oh yeah, they're gonna make the playoffs. I was talking to Rob the Hammer Hammersmith yesterday. He basically was a used car salesman talking them up, and I was like, yeah, I, I'm listening to everything you're saying. I was like, absolutely, they're gonna make the playoffs. And of course, they didn't again. It's just it's just one of those things. They got to get that monkey off their back this year, man. And they 100%. might. I, I think the sexy pick is. To say Miami's, you know, going to do well. But last year I thought Chicago was going to pull all the the Gill talent yeah. and, and run the table and wins were hard to come by. So it, it's you clearly Bozo. hard to just start a franchise and excel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think obviously the betting favorite out West would be uh, San Diego, then Seattle. Right. And Utah yep. is like a third. Mm-hmm. Um, and out East, I would probably say, yeah, I mean, it, it would be, Free Jacks, DC, and then yep. a Miami or or maybe a NOLA. Who knows? It's, yeah, it's going to be exciting, though. I really hope, 100%. like like I said, with the schedule change, they reduce the playoff teams to six Yeah, so that the uh, regular season has a little more juice. You know, I kind of like almost shed a tear in this last college football playoffs because it was the last, you know, four-team playoff. Mm-hmm. And now they're going to expand it to 12, and 
to me that just like it takes the juice out of a September 20th game, you know, where teams like college football just had that win or go home feeling, you know, yep. where fuck if we lose one game, the season's over. Right, um, right. Now that won't be the case, but you know, MLR, no, no one's expecting a team to go undefeated. You know no. how hard it is to to win win week in and week out. Uh, but what you see is the best teams. You know, they they win three out of four, and then they win three out of four, and then they win three out of four, and they just yep. do that over and over. Um, and then you got to get hot when when the playoff timing's right. So exactly. when the schedule is finally set, and they say this is you know, the window, we'll see. Yeah. Um, because there's also like a weird thing going on in the playoffs where the Eagles will be playing games as well. You know, so they're right. talking about yeah. a break and then maybe coming back into playoff games. I don't know. That's um, going to be a weird transition for sure. That first year of this happening is going to be very, very make or break for some teams to try to get that right. I mean, some teams are going to be hurt more than others uh, with that. You know, the Free Jacks have excellent depth. So I would imagine a lot of the GMs were like, we have to have really good depth this year if we're going to lose a couple of important starters during this time where it's, you know, it's make or break potentially yeah, yeah in the season. Well, Phil, I'm just excited to, to hear you, Bozo, and, and the whole gang. Um, check in week to week because you know the content's awesome, the banter's awesome, but the Appreciate reality it. is, it's it's a family. It's it's the Jacks Rangers, the first regiment. You know, oh yeah, oh um, yeah. I'm I still claim to be a uh, founding member. You there know, you go. I'm not a founding season ticket holder, kid. but I was at the first game. They can't take that away from me. And that one of, that was one of the most excellent episodes you ever did. Is is covering that game. It basically in real time as it was happening. That was so cool that you did that. I would love to try that on our show at some point, maybe on like a playoff game or something like that. If folks haven't listened to it, go and check that episode out where uh, you know you were out there with the, with the mics and stuff. It just yeah, the boots having, on the ground. Like, there yeah, they boots call on like the man, man with the mic. Like exactly, it's definitely hard if you want to take in the game because you really have to yeah. read people's social cues and see if they're <laughs> open to you sticking a microphone in their face, but. Obviously, when the libations are flowing, it gets a lot easier. And mm -hmm. um, I'm actually about to to publish. Uh, I'm calling it uh, 2023 Bordeaux: The Lost Tapes. Uh, okay. I did some man on the mic stuff in Bordeaux, France, for the opening weekend nice. of the World Cup. Um, and yeah, it's it's funny listening to it three months later and editing the footage and be like, man, we did have a good time. Um, nice. But yeah, it. I'm almost ready to, uh, on the rugby pick'em side of things, you know, really get back into kind of publishing weekly and, mm -hmm. and following the MLR almost like a beat. But nice. I want to hear from, you know, God forbid we, we, you know, give the MLR Reddit crowd a, a louder voice than they already have. But I oh, want to hear from them. Like, wh what are people interested in reading? Because yeah. there's plenty of people that do awesome, like, week-to-week -week breakdown. Um, but I don't know. Do people want to hear, like, deep dive on, on players' journeys? Do, I was pitching uh, maybe weekly doing a meaningless stat of the week. Okay. So kind of beating a jam delay at his own game. There you but go. Instead of good stats, we'll just provide meaningless stats that don't really mean much and reporting <laughs> it on that. I don't know. I, I'm all ears for what people want to read and what people want to hear yeah. uh, on a week to week podcast, but we'll see. Um, I, I certainly have a lot of balls up in the air for me. So it's hard to sit down and watch six games every single it's weekend and, yeah. and get a, a fresh podcast out every Monday. Right. But, you know, cheers to the guys like Mike, Matt McCarthy, who, who do it week to week. Cheers yeah. to the Jacks Rangers who, who follow the, the well, beat we, report. We, Thank God we follow one team, right? Like I That's watch true. one game a week, my friend. That's <laughs> it. Like uh, and what I'll do, and I did this last year, is like the first weekend I'll be so jazzed up that MLR is back that I'll watch every single game, and then I'll completely fall off the cliff and and just follow the Free Jacks. And, and then everybody's like, "Did you see that game? Uh, you know, Houston and whoever." And I'm like, "Nope, didn't see it. Yeah. I saw the Free Jacks though. Sure did." Yeah, <laughs> so. it is fun to have all the screens up opening weekend. I, yeah. I recall, 100%. I think it was like two years ago when the Guiltinis were playing their first game. I invited some buddies over and we're like even if you don't know anything about rugby just mm -hmm. look at the name on the screen and tell me yeah. you're not entertained uh, but 100%. we uh i i wonder i heard pete sickle went on that show and he said that the uh the mm -hmm. la fc is kind of like a placeholder and that they were going to let the uh the fans kind of like pick the direction of the franchise mm -hmm. um I, I find that cool you know uh user feedback um but 
this year that that might be a team that that um overwhelms not underwhelms overwhelms interesting um, because th these guys i don't know how much you know about the tel aviv heat but they've the ownership champions, group right? has uh they play in like a europe's second division yep um but it's it's definitely an impressive outfit and i was lucky enough to help with that squad one summer when they came for a rugby town sevens oh cool um, but you know, plenty of money, and these guys have experience operating rugby clubs. Mm -hmm. So the LA team will have its year one struggles, but yeah, you can guarantee that you know a long flight out there for the East Coast teams. It's not going to be an easy win for anybody. No, absolutely, that's a great point. What do you think about the name overall? Like for what they've come up with as a, potentially a placeholder, and also just the logo itself. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've heard heard all types of thoughts on the logo. Um, yeah. I didn't realize that, uh, oak trees, you know, were, were that kind of, um, oh, representative come on. You didn't, you didn't think of LA. immediately, uh, LA with oak trees. What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, cause apparently like what's happened now in, in the whole California landscape is, you know, it's, it's a beautiful weather state. Uh, people travel there and they plant invasive species, uh, kind of like outgrow and there's all eucalyptus trees now. and it's because internationals moved to California and then they, they plant the things that they take right. with them on, on boats dating back to, you know, the early exploration days, but sure. the Oak tree is native to Southern LA and, and uh, yeah, on a, on a good hot summer day, the, the Oak trees, they got those thick leaves. It's a really good shade tree. Hmm. And uh, if you're hanging around there in the fall, maybe an acorn falls on your head. I always, I always pronounce the word acorn as egg corn as a child yeah. and then i saw it in writing and i'm like oh i'm way off is that a connecticut thing or just I, you? maybe i just <laughs> like, like, yeah just like making up words but very good um, yeah i think that's a the placeholder logo um but at least they they got a set of colors that was unique to the league I mean, yeah you got to look at who withdrew two teams that were based in blue yeah uh, you, you need it on the palette you know, you got to look at the color palette and see, like, what are we missing here as a league? Mm -hmm. I think we're due, certain, due for some orange now that the Gilgronies are gone. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate the color orange. You know, Auburn, Florida, Clemson, yeah, Tennessee, yeah. man. I, I fucking hate that color. <laughs> Un unless unless it's Halloween, I got no use for that. Um, but, yeah, BT, get me on the rugby pick em. Uh, You haven't done an episode since, uh, what was it, October of last year? So, I mean, are you, you, you're you talking about – I mean, I had up. so many like coaching uh, obligations. I, I coach like middle school, high school, college, I help out with the men's club. So yeah, it's like doing a podcast that you don't get paid for isn't always at the top of the list, but you right. know, we do it for the people. We, we do it there for the, the MLR Redditors, the bottom of the barrel uh, <laughs> comment warriors, yep. um, you know, that like to hop on there every Sunday and give their two cents on their burner accounts. Uh, <laughs> no, man, I, I I also just like, I like listening to podcasts. So I knew way back when it was like, Hey, if you, if you start one, then it might be a good way to engage people and, and, and talk rugby with them and spread the word. But uh -huh. Phil, I got to ask you, you know, I'm, I'm always pulling up my, my prep and my research. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm on your free, your Jack's Rangers webpage. Never heard and, of it. And uh, we might yeah. have to get the, uh, the origin story pictures updated because <laughs> we have a, a, a picture of a, Fierce young Phil Harris. I was fierce uh, back in the day, my friend. Into Boy, the camera I like he's run gonna kill over. somebody. That's right. Yeah. That was me. Yep. I was. Listening <laughs> I think. To I think we need to update it with the, uh, you know, uh, unicorn uh, dyed mustache and, and, and the <laughs> mullet. Maybe, maybe that's more appropriate these days. For sure. But for sure. Different no, guy. you guys got a great team, man. Diamond Dave, Bozo, yep. uh, Dave Lawrence. Everybody that gets on and contributes, even even your rotation of all yep. the guests, are, yeah, are fantastic. I appreciate it. I love the praise, man. I mean, I, well, I work hard at this stuff. Like, you know, it's it's all for fun and it's all for engagement and trying to grow the game. But it does take a lot of time, so it's always nice to hear people that appreciate the show. You know, and I, congrats on the Incafi sponsorship. Thanks, um, man. I listened to that guy on the episode, and his accent is is great. It's great, he's, right? Yeah, got a great accent. Always, always, I'm a sucker for a good accent, no matter what. So, born in Portugal, but raised in New England, so that's pretty yeah, unique for sure. It's the best. Um, our, our boy Buzz, Buzzy's here. 
with three hearts showing up in the comments. Love that. Best in the biz. No Best doubt. Best in the biz, Buzzy. No doubt. Yeah. He, he's emblematic of, you know, a, a classic Northeasterner mm -hmm. um, who just loves giving back to the game. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. I love he that loves guy. it. He lives for it. One of my favorites. If I if I don't see him at a game, I feel like I've missed something. You know what I'm saying? Like I always want to see Buzzy at the Free Jacks games or on the road. You know, he's a great road warrior out there. Goes to pretty much all of the Free Jacks away games when he can. So really, really appreciate him being a part of the fan base and a Ranger. Uh, what do we got here? Hope Charlotte beats Dallas and regulates uh, relegates. Excuse me, the lowly Jackals to the bottom of the table. That could be a possibility. You know, that's one thing that has not happened is Dallas hasn't announced a ton of players. I know that Rick Collins was kind of complaining about that recently. I mean, who is this Dallas team that's going to be assembled? It's very, very interesting. Obviously, they went with uh, Argentinians last year. That was a, a huge contingent. But I, I just don't know about them, man. You know, I just don't know. I, I hope it works out. I mean, they need to win some games to get some butts in the seats, as we talked about. Uh, that's a, a surefire way to get fans through the door is winning games, and they haven't done a lot of that in the past two years that they've been in the league. Any thoughts on Dallas? Not really. <laughs> my, my last connection to Dallas was Mike Matarazza, but he's playing for the Chicago Hounds now. So mm -hmm. I, I actually remember when, when he signed with the Hounds, he had given me a nice knit cap. I still have it, Dallas Jackals. And I sent him a picture and I said, should I burn the hat? Yeah. Question mark. <laughs> now, now that you're no longer yep. a Dallas guy. But now I like to collect little items of swag from all over the league, especially the brands that no longer exist. Oh, so I got okay. my Giltini's hat, my Gilgronis hat. Nice. Um, I have a great like rugby ATL with the snake logo. Oh, that, I that got was the from best. A local there. I mean that that one never even got like incorporated. Right. That was yep. just that was chance when Lewski being yeah. an artist and and drawing something up. But yeah, I don't know the the league. It's hard to say it has a bright future because I don't see an economic path mm -hmm. out of the owners just writing checks and, and losing money, but yeah. the MLS did it. So yeah. we, we got to step our game up and figure out how, I think the TV deal is key. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I love the rugby network cause I just get to hop on my computer and get access to all the games. But yep. the reality is you, you need a live right steal to survive. Yeah. So yep. hopefully the LA people can get with Fox sports and make it right. I mean, that that's a great point is, you know, you have to continue to write checks until the thing makes money. And MLS is a great example of that. And they had some turmoil at the beginning of that league. You know, teams folded. I think they had they went down to like four owners. A bunch of the ownership groups had to buy other franchises. Otherwise, they would tank and stuff like that. So, I mean, I hope that's not in the cards for us. But we've already seen turmoil within this league. And that's kind of natural and stuff like that. But eventually, hopefully, this thing turns a profit. Because, you know, I had Eric Anderson, the owner, the majority owner of the free Jacks uh, on this program last season before the start of the season. I said, do the Free Jacks make a profit? Because the Free Jacks do great with merchandise. They get people through the door. They get, you know, butts in seats. Very, very important. And he laughed at me. Like, he was like, no. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, still only a fraction of the operating costs. Right. But. So it's just, it's just yeah. W hopefully we'll get to the point of profitability, but, you know, it's going to be a long, hard road to get there, and we just have to have more eyeballs on it. I always say that. I've been saying that since the beginning. Since I found rugby. Is I just wish more people would find and watch it because they would fall in love with it. So that's all of our jobs. Everybody listening to this, you and I, we're kind of trying to move that needle forward, right? That's, that's what this is all about. So. Well, Phil, I'm going to work my ass off for the next seven years to 2031. And if Denver is a host city and the Eagles are playing at mile high, I'm going to have the biggest pregame party known to man. Hell yeah. Everybody's invited. I'll be there. Um, but it's it's a long ways away and there's plenty of work to do. So That's right. for those that are listening, even if it's just coaching a, a high school team or you know, just signing up your kid for rugby. That's yeah. that's huge. It's a, it's a great step forward. Mm -hmm. And we just need like a, a million of those tiny little right. decisions and, and efforts to be pushed together into to one big push. Yeah. 
hundred percent. I've got two more comments here for you. Two more questions rather before we get you out of here, BT. Uh, this one for Bozo. How about MLR dunking on the stupid American Raptors by getting this franchise concept launch? He's talking about the Charlotte uh, Hawks. You know, the, the American Raptors released their um, roster today and I've got a little funny clip coming out tomorrow regarding this and they're just complete irrelevancy within this whole landscape, not being an MLR, uh, and now, you know, the Charlotte uh, Hawks being a franchise that kind of does what they do to a certain extent. What's your thoughts? I mean, you're you're a uh, I'll push back. I'll push. Go, back. Go ahead. It's hard to say complete irrelevancy. <laughs> I mean, they're representing the only American team in Super Rugby Americas, where I know a lot cares. of MLR stands, as they say, they don't want to admit it. But Super Rugby Americas might be on the same standard if not higher than mlr wow I know hot that's take. like hot take poisonous to say in in that the mlr reddit but the reality is like look who just beat us in qualifying chile uruguay yeah. argentina sprinkles so many pros through that league because mm -hmm. they know that uruguay paraguay uh, like they're their partners they're their yeah. partners so they make it so that all those teams are are pretty even and I don't know. I went to a lot of games last year because hey, that's like the professional rugby we got going on here in sure. Denver, Colorado. And yeah. the standards high. They play some some crazy good rugby. Um, but look, it, everybody's got different opinions. I know Mayor Mike Donovan said, you know, the go, the reason why they were withdrawing from MLR mm -hmm. was so that they could develop Americans. But you know, not everything everybody says is factual right right <laughs> you know it, it could have been because of disagreements with the gilly situation back right. then right yeah. in the front office and the fact that like a a who a at the time multi-millionaire billionaire was buying up a big chunk of the league maybe mm -hmm. that is why glendale wanted out it, it really doesn't matter at this point they're yeah. playing in super rugby americas yeah. they do have some signings who i want to give a shout out to my guys uh john lefebvre who played for Old Glory for a minute. He signed with Glendale and uh, Javon Camp. My, he I just also my boy. spent some time. We yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know these guys. Like, of course I do. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I, I met with Javon and we had breakfast and I kind of asked him about how his past couple of years has been. And his time in New England was awesome. He, he got down to uh, Newcastle, Australia, played for the Wildfires. Yep. I remember that, um, yeah. You know, and, and he's just, look, he's, all these guys want to be an eagle right yeah so where are you going to play immediately and put up good tape that can get in front of scott and the selectors yeah. that's what it comes down to if you really want to be an eagle you can't go ride the pine somewhere and right. quite frankly like you know being paid a good contract and having your housing taken care of and all the stuff that like glendale knows how to do that they've been doing mm. it forever you know yeah. they don't have to scramble and put together housing at the last minute like it's kind of a well-oiled operation, if, if you want to say that. Yeah. Um, but, hey, I, I'm not going to poo-poo it. It's, uh, it's the rugby we have here in Denver. And, you know, when the Raptors are successful and, and those guys are playing well and uh, the Eagles come into town and scout and do camps in Glendale, I love that, you know, yeah. because – more rugby people come through my city. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, obviously it's good for you guys there in Denver to have professional rugby uh, since with the withdrawal of MLR. And I, I just wonder, how would you, quick question, how do you think they would do if they were in MLR right now? Well, last year they were sub 500 in Super Rugby Americas. Yep. I think this year they, they outperformed that. Um, and it's all, are they going to win on the road? That's the hardest thing. Right. Are they going to win down in Argentina, down Long in Uruguay against nasty fan bases, yeah. right? That are giving it to them. Um, I think they will be above 500 this year. And okay. I think if they played the MLR this year, they would be above 500 as well. I don't mm -hmm. know if they'd be a lead league or a league leading team, mm -hmm. um, and run, run the table, but I do think, you know, that they would outperform the majority of kind of those like 500 sub 500 MLR sure. teams. 
Okay. Um, that's just my opinion. I but you know, you know what's funny about podcasts? You just get to chuck opinions out there and no one 100%. Really follows up with the on and off. I can, <laughs> you know, listen, I, I, I'm at a South Carolina, North Carolina education level, man. Like, I don't know shit about shit. And I'm just yeah. having fun on here. You know, I love yeah. my teams and I don't know much about nothing, but uh, I enjoy talking shit. So that's, that's good. I know there was some chat, you know, with the NCR having an all-star tournament being like, could the MLR ever do that? And mm -hmm. it comes down to money. The answer yeah. is no. Like, you're not going to get pros to just <laughs> play an extra game unless they're financially compensated. Of no course. one's going to risk injury. You've seen what the NFL all-star game has devolved to. It's yeah. basically flag rugby. It's and, cool, and yeah. you know, those guys get paid millions. Why would you roll your ankle going, you know, 100%? at an all-star event. It just doesn't make sense. So yeah. if, if they can make, make it a financially viable weekend and make it so that all the people who get selected, you know, have a kind of a fun weekend and put on like almost like a barbarians performance, you right. know, yep. like a, a fun game like that, where they're just looking to score a million tries and give the fans a good time. We'll see. I mean, that's all well and good, but I don't really care about that compared to a uh, Champions League of North and South American teams. Let's get the champion from MLR to play the uh, the, the. That would be cool. Yeah, that yeah. would so be really cool. That's really what people. Super need to be Rugby's about. champion versus MLR champion. 100%. We'll do it at the end of August. Yep, yeah. and have it somewhere, maybe you know Dallas, Texas, or you know yeah. Houston, perhaps you know. Uh, somewhere like that, kind of in the middle, so to speak. Um, yeah, and, and and crown a true champion of the Americas. I think that is really the next stage. I mean, screw a competition where like it doesn't matter and like people are like half-assing it or whatever with an all-star competition. No, no, no. Let's have a real prestigious, like everybody balls to the walls, that bragging rights between North and South America. Let's have that. That's what I want to see. And Phil, one last opinion, because I know you'd sound off on this one. Yeah. I don't know why they they pre-announce the final. Just just let the top seed host. Come 100%. 100%. On. Come on. I, I get it. You want to make a big thing of it and get yep. a performing artist. But, like, well, won't the best team hopefully have the most engaged fan base at the time and be able to what, sell tickets? Well, here's know. the issue. The MLR, you know, the reason why they continue to do it with a predestination with, that they've decided upon and they've announced early on is New York fumbled the ball big time. Right. That, that's this is what this comes down to is they had to go into a MLS stadium that was 90 percent empty and an embarrassment to the league that they had to spend a ton of money to rent. This is all New York's fault. That, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> I know they yeah. no longer exist and I'm dancing on their grave and it's kind of sad. But at the same time, that's really what it all is all about, because the next year they said Chicago's the place. Everybody's going to come here at the final. And that is what it is. Now they're going to possibly do uh, San Diego. So that whole number one seed, all that sort of stuff, that goes that gets thrown out, unfortunately, because the terror that was New York and their their shitty high school stadium that nobody would go to. Um, so well, that, perfect storyline if we have New England come out of the East, San yep. Diego out of the West. Yeah, finals rematch. Are you hopping on a plane and making it there to drink out of the cup again? E I mean, I would, I, yes. I mean, the answer we'll is yes. We'll keep a piggy bank. We'll keep a piggy bank. There It'll you say, you know, only break in emergency. <laughs> that that yeah. is the emergency situation. Well, of course, I'm going to Belfast for six days to, for our independence to play the Ulster Academy. So that's my big away trip. But yeah, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make my way down you'll there. Got, you'll have time to save up again. Exactly. Yep. Got to yeah. replenish the funds. But uh, one final question for you, BT. This has been fantastic. We always run along with you, but it's always very good. You, you're very different in terms of your approach to these things compared to me because I'm very structured. That's that German heritage coming out. But like, I just kind of like shooting the shit with you. But my final question is, uh, what would you say to the Rangers out there, the Free Jacks fans? What do you have to say to them? I got one word for you, Phil. <laughs> Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> Thank you.